Hi, this is Karen Launchbaugh again with the Rangeland Principals class at the University of Idaho. And whenever you think about grazing management on rangelands, of course, livestock production is a very important product of rangelands. It really is important to set the appropriate stocking rate. Recall that carrying capacity is some measure of the productivity of the land. It's, it's how many animals could that land support on a long-term basis without having any damage to the ecosystem with no ecological damage. So whether you're talking about wildlife or livestock, there are some amount of animals that could be grazed on that land and not cause damage. Uh, this is usually expressed as uh, some number of animals per some amount of area over some amount of time. In the West, we usually describe it in acres per AUM. How many acres would it take to provide enough forage for one animal unit for one month? Stocking rate usually reflects carrying capacity, but it's a little bit different. Stocking rate is the number of animals the land manager chooses to put on the land. What did they decide to put out there based on their management goals? It includes the number of animals, some area of land, and some amount of time. And we usually describe it as the number of acres per AUM, much the same as we describe carrying capacity. Remember that it is considered one of the most important grazing decisions. It's really important because it affects rangeland health, it affects animal productivity and economic returns on the range. We've been talking about a few terms, and so now we're going to define those. Um, one was an animal unit. So an animal unit um, is an idea that, uh, that animals could be uh, just thought of as just 1,000 pound units. This came about when the Forest Service first started permitting grazing at the early part of the 19th century. There weren't very many scales around, so it was difficult to weigh every animal that was put on the range, but they could count them. And so most cows were about a thousand pounds, even though some were a little higher and some were less. They just said, if we count every more animal out there and call them an animal unit, that, that's what the what you know what we try to do. So uh, for a thousand pound animal, uh, one cow, a thousand pounds would be equal one animal unit. For horses, um, a horse would be uh, less. It would take uh, less than a horse to create an animal unit. So horses eat more than cows. So it takes a little more than half of a horse to make an animal unit. Um, steers eat less than a, a mature cow. So it takes a few more steers to make an animal unit, 1.3. Sheep eat, uh, they weigh about uh, one fifth of a cow. So they eat about one fifth of a cow. So it takes five sheep to make one animal unit. You can do this for almost any animal on the range, including jackrabbits. And uh, someone published at one time that it would take 50 jackrabbits to make an animal unit. It's also cool to think of this sort of in the, in, in the other way, which we call an animal unit equivalent. And this is a factor that reflects the number of animal units in the average animal. So again, a thousand pound cow would be one animal unit. A horse would be 1.8 animal units. A yearling steer would be a fraction of an animal unit, maybe 7.75. Uh, a sheep would be 0.2 of an animal unit and jackrabbit would be 0.02. So you kind of look at it both ways, but you get the idea. Uh, these animal unit equivalents have been described for many types of animals. Again, you get the idea that um, uh, a 1,000 pound cow with a calf would be one animal unit. Uh, when she's dry, she'd be less than an animal unit. A bull is heavy, they're, they're big animals, they eat a lot, so they're 1.35 animal units. Um, a really a sheep again is 0.2 takes five sheep to make an animal unit. Uh, it can be used for wildlife like um, white-tailed deer. A mature white-tailed deer might be a 0.15 animal units, or about six deer equals an animal unit. Uh, a mature bison, about a thousand pound bison, would be about the same as a cow. So you get this sense, you get this the gist of what animal unit equivalent um, uh, describes in this table. Okay, so another way to look at animal demand is not not so much in animal units, but um, in trying to understand how much animals eat in a day. And one thing we know from what we've discussed previously in this class is that ruminants eat a certain percent of body weight a day on a yearly basis. And we said that they eat about two and a half percent of their body weight each day of dry matter forage. Um, horses and rabbits are hindgut fermenters, and because of their digestive system, they eat more than a ruminants. They eat about 3% of their body weight per day. Okay, so if that's true, then we have this term, 
an animal unit month. It's the amount of forage an animal unit will eat in a month. AUM, animal unit month. I want to forage an animal eats in a month. So if you have an animal, uh, an animal unit that grazes and eats two and a half percent of its body weight for a month or 30 days, how many pounds is an animal unit? Think about it. It's just a little bit of math. So each animal unit um, weighs how much? A thousand pounds. They eat two and a half percent of their body weight each day, which means they eat 25 pounds a day. If an animal unit is the amount that they eat in a month, then they eat 25 pounds a day times 30 days, so 750 pounds. So the number that we'll use in this class is that an animal unit month equals 750 pounds of forage. Remember, an animal unit is a thousand pound animal. An animal unit month isn't a unit of forage. It's 750 pounds of forage. Be honest with you, um, different agencies have different numbers for what um, that AUM is. For example, the Natural Resources Conservation Service uses 780. They're a little more conservative on what an AUM is. Other people might use less or more, but for this class, we're just gonna focus on that 750 because it it's really relates to how much an animal eats per day. So put that in your brain, an animal unit month equals 750 pounds of forage. So now let's talk about stocking rates. How do we actually, um, you know, balance that supply and demand? How do we actually set a stocking rate? Well, we're going to describe just a really simple four-step step method, um, and you'll be able to use this in class on different projects. Uh, the forage demand method is a simple method where you calculate the usable forage, you make any adjustments for water, terrain, or other constraints, then you calculate the demand of the animal, and you calculate the forage, the stocking rate, which is that supply and demand balance. So I'm going to walk you through those four steps. I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of background, though, even though this is kind of a simple method, it's not one we use very often. Most often, Stocking rates are set on what, what has been done in the past and whether it's working or not, but you might use this forage demand method when you have no information on previous years. Say you bought a, a new place or a place that hadn't been grazed in a number of years. You might also use it um, to calculate carrying capacity for a land appraisal. So let's say you want to sell the ranch. Rather than telling them how many cows you graze, you might want to know what it's capable of grazing. And then also you might use uh, this forage demand method when you're thinking about changing the type of livestock or the type of animals you graze. Say you want to change from sheep to cattle, then you might want to go back to the basics and, and calculate with this forage demand method. So let's start through these first four steps. The first is to calculate usable supply of forage. But the, the very first place to start is to take a look at how what your biomass supply is. You take the weight of biomass per acre and you time and you multiply it by the total area on your ranch in acres or the total area you're managing, that'll give you the total supply in pounds or in kilograms. So you can get that weight of biomass by clipping grass, or you can get it from uh, some book values re related to the soil and the precipitation. That's a pretty simple approach to get the amount per acre, multiply by acres, get total biomass. But there's a caveat. You can't use all the grass that's out on the range. You have to leave some behind. Generally, we definitely recommend that you leave some forage behind for the health and regrowth of the plant. If you keep grazing it down to the ground, it won't have the photosynthetic material it needs to recover. You also want to leave some forage behind for livestock. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, for wildlife. Livestock are not the only thing out on the range. You want to leave some for those large ruminant livestock like elk and deer, but you also want to leave some forage for the grasshoppers and the jackrabbits. So when you were setting a proper stocking rate, you need to make sure that the wildlife are provided for. And finally, you have to have some um, biomass that falls over on the ground and creates organic matter, helps to prevent erosion and really keep soil healthy. This diagram shows that you need to, re if you remove the leaves, you affect the roots. So you need to set a stocking rate that somehow keeps the roots healthy because when the roots are healthy, you don't have a lot of invasive plants and you keep the soil in a really productive state. So we have to set a proper use factor. We cannot take all of it, but how much can we take? 
Well, uh, the idea of a proper use factor is that we're going to set the stocking rate somewhere below carrying capacity to keep the land healthy on a long-term basis. And there have been studies done across the West, and uh, these are some general numbers that have come across them. On sagebrush steppe grassland, scientists working in this region have said you can take 34, 30 to 40% of the annual production every year and the land will still stay healthy. It will still continue to reproduce and do well. The shortgrass prairie is in, you know, on the east side of the Rockies, and it's an area that had very heavy bison grazing in its evolution, and the plants are very resistant to grazing. So you can take more in the plains than you can on, on the west side of the Rockies. In the plains, you, those lands can sustain 40 to 50 percent um, removal every year and still remain healthy. When you get up into the mountains, both coniferous forests and maybe at those bench lands, oak woodlands, a lot of the ecosystems that we deal with in the Intermountain West, 30 to 40 would be a pretty good number. So uh, in the, some of the readings that we've had, uh, you can look for research that relates to these. But in general, in west of the Rockies, we're talking about 30 to 40 percent of, of uh, biomass that can be used every year under a proper use idea so that it would sustain those lands into the future. So we're going to go back to that basic stocking rate. Uh, if you take all of the amount that you have and you multiply it times the recommended use, you'll get the usable forage. That's the allowable use or recommended use level that you're going to be able to use on the land. And it should give you not the total amount of forage, but the usable forage supply. So do the math. First, we talked about the weight of biomass per acre times acres for the total biomass supply. Now convert that by taking the total biomass and multiplying it by that proper use factor. And then you'll get the total forage supply on your management unit. So now we're ready to calculate the usable supply of forage. Let's take an example. Let's suppose you manage a 1,200 acre ranch and its average production is 500 pounds per acre and you've decided since you live in the sagebrush steppe that you can use about 30% of it. So what's your usable forage supply? Your ranch is 1,200 acres. It produces 500 pounds per acre. If you multiply those two, you get 600,000 pounds of biomass. So that's how much is totally out there. It could be used, but you're only going to use 30% of it in order to maintain the supply of forage for wildlife and for residue for the soil and, and for the plants themselves. So if you use 30% of that, then you have 180,000 pounds of forage to use. So again, this is when we think about pounds. We could also express this in terms of animal unit months of forage. Remember, an AUM is a unit of forage. How much is it again? Can you remember? It's 750 pounds. The amount that a 1,000 pound animal would eat in a month is 750 pounds. So how many AUMs are there in your 180,000 pounds of forage per your unit, per your ranch? 180,000 pounds of forage divided by 750 is 240 AUMs in the pasture or in the unit. So the next step then is to make sure that all the forage that you're accounting for in your equation is actually available to the animals. And one thing we know is that animals don't like to travel too far from water. So some book values that have been described uh, would be that if, an, if land is within a mile of water, you don't have to make any reduction to grazing capacity. It's all available. If it's one to two miles from water, then, then not all of it's available. The animals are not going to go as far to find it. So you have to reduce that amount by 50%. If it's over two miles from water, this author, Holacek, says the animals really won't use it at all. So you can't even consider that forage there because it's really not available. So I'll only say one thing is that it really depends on the animal and the land, depending on how steep the land is, how, how easy it is to walk, and then, of course, what the animals themselves uh, feel is right. Some, some animals will travel further from water. Plus the forage sometimes has a lot of water in it. So there's a lot of if, ands, and buts when they come up with these equations. But it is important to realize that not everything in the pasture is available to animals. And part of that is because of the distance to water. When you're trying to figure out how much of a pasture animals we use, uh, this is a an example of a, a pattern use map where we're trying to see how does 
use um, look like across this whole pasture. And you'll see that there's this area of really concentrated use, this pink area. And that concentrated use is probably because of a water tank. As you move out from that, the yellow would be moderate, and then green is light, and blue is slight. And then as you get further and further away, you could consider that land sort of inaccessible or unusable. So the point here is that even though you calculate the amount of available forage on your unit, not all of it's actually available, and you have to account for distance from water. Another adjustment that you might need to make is slope. Um, really steep country is not very well used by most livestock. So uh, again, just kind of book values for how much of that you can use. Uh, the, um, the Holacek in his book recommends that a slope that is zero to 10%, there's no change. Animals can use that completely. You don't need to reduce the carrying capacity of the ranch. If it's 11 to 30% slope, then it starts to be a little more access, less accessible. So probably 30% of that would be available. And if it's 31 to 60% slope, then only 60% is available, or it has to be reduced. O only 40% is available. So you have to reduce the amount of carrying capacity by 60%. And when the slope is over 60%, then it's essentially not usable. So you have to reduce by 100%. So here's a map, uh, again, that would, that would just kind of describe what areas of the ranch are used, uh, the areas that are low and level versus the areas that are not very well used and not really available to grazing because they're too steep. Uh, so uh, you can see where you could map on your uh, pasture areas that were usable or not usable depending on how steep they are. So the, again, the second step is to make some adjustments due to slope and distance from water, but the, these guidelines are not rules. Uh, it really depends a lot on the species, the breed, and the experience. This mat, this picture here is some cows near Riggins, and those cows, they, they just grew up using really steep country, and they don't know anything differently. And so cows from the plains that grew up on level ground wouldn't know what to do with this, but these cows are able to distribute relatively well. So that species and where they came from could affect how they use this landscape. Topography and soils could also affect it too. Uh, sandy soils are a little harder for animals to walk on than, than more firm soils or that, that steepness. And then finally, the season of grazing, especially um, the water, the amount of water. In the spring, the forage has so much water that animals can further, travel quite a lot further uh, from a water source or a water tank than later in the season when it's hotter and drier. So again, these are guidelines. It's really important to look at your pasture and decide in the time that I'm grazing it, what are the factors that are going to influence the accessibility of forage? Okay, now we're ready to move on to step three. We know what our accessible and usable forage is. Now let's figure out what the demand is. How much do those animals need? So in review, animals um, have a weight and ruminants that eat ten, generally eat about two and a half percent of their body weight per day in dry matter. Hind gut fermenters, we assume, eat about 3%. Of course, that varies throughout the year, but on average, it would be 25 and 3%. So to get the forage demand, you just have to take the weight of animals times the daily um, matter intake times the number of days they're on the pasture and will be grazed, and then you'll get the forage demand per animal per season. So here's an example. Uh, if an average cow on your ranch raises a thousand pounds and you're going to graze it for 30 months, for I'm sorry, for three months or 90 days, how much forage would you expect them to eat? A thousand pound cow, she eats two and a half percent of her body weight per day. That means 25 pounds a day times 90 days means that in the whole grazing season of three months, she'll eat 2,250 pounds. So how many AUMs is that? Remember, we can express demand in animal unit months. And remember that an animal unit month is 750 pounds of forage. Uh, a thousand pound animal eats two and a half percent of her body weight per day. That's 25 pounds times 30 days is 750. AUM, the amount of forage an animal eats in a month. So how many AUMs are there in that 2,250 2, pound that we know a forage, uh, a forage a cow will eat? So you take 2,250 pounds and you divide it by 750 because that's what's in an AUM and you get three AUMs. So each cow 
is out there for three months, so she's going to eat three AUMs of forage. Let's go to step four then. Now we have the supply and the demand. Now, what is the actual stocking rate? How many cows should you have in your herd if your usable forage is 180,000 pounds per pasture and the forage demand for each cow is 2,250? Well, your forage supply is 180,000 pounds. Your forage demand is 2,250 pounds per cow. That means you need 80 cows. Simple math. You know how much you have. You divide by how much each animal eats, and your stocking rate will be 80 cows per season of three months on your pasture or ranch. Again, you could also calculate this in AUMs. You know that your base herd has 240 AUMs in supply, and you know that each cow requires three AUMs. So 240 AUM supply, three AUMs demand means 80 cows. So no matter how you calculate it, you'll come up with 80 cows. So to bring this to completion, just remember that when you report a stocking rate, you need to have some amount of animals, usually animal numbers or animal units, some amount of days, months, or years, some time, and then uh, reported per area uh, in acres or hectares. So usually we report stocking rate as acres per AUM. In the West, that would be the number of acres it is required to support one animal unit for a month. Or in the East, where it's more productive, they often um, have the number of animals that you could put on an acre for a month or an AUM per acre. So there you have it, just a few um, basic guidelines on how to set a stocking rate. Of course, it takes a lot of experience, a lot of trying and a lot of monitoring, but that's the basics.